here. I appreciate Brian Station Baptist Church and thank God for you all. And uh, it's just a joy to be with you this morning. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4. When they said about Brother Ross singing the special, Brother, there's about 20 people that got it and ran out the back. <laughs> I thought, oh, no. I thought, what in the world? Oh, just kidding. Let's ask God's blessing first. Father, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you for your goodness to us. And, Lord, we thank you for Bryan Station Baptist Church and for faithfulness all through the years. And, Lord, not just here in this area, dear God, but even around the world, all the output and all the mission points, Lord, that she's done. And, and just all those things, dear God, and fruits around the world for all that is going out from this church, dear God. And, uh, but, Lord, we praise you because we know all, all good things come from you, Lord. Bless the message today, bless, bless this church, bless her pastor, and bless each one that's here, Father, from other places. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's read 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. The Bible says there, I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight, I've finished my course, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. And you know, as I read that, I was thinking about Paul, you know, the time of his departure. And, uh, you know, I think most of us, as we get older, we think about, you know, our time of departure. You know, how's it going to be when we leave this world? And, and, uh, and I think that one of the main things about Paul that just pops out in my head is his faithfulness, you know. Amen. And uh, I love that verse where he says, I have... Uh, uh, where he says, I've finished my, I fought a good fight, I've finished my course, I've kept the faith. You know, I've been in the ministry long enough to look around and see, sad to say, many people can't have that, don't have that testimony that they have kept the faith, you know. Um, I was ordained back in 91, and uh, I, re I still have the Bible that was given to me when I was ordained, and I think there's like 29 men that, that signed the Bible that was on the presbytery, and you know, but looking back through those, and not counting ones who have passed on, of course, but, you know, how many of those men are no longer even in the ministry? And uh, it's kind of a sad thing when I look at my Bible and I think of it that way, I think, wow, you know. And, uh, and then I focus on Paul and I think, but Paul, Paul did, you know, Paul kept the faith. And uh, so I think it's remarkable. You know, the Bible says, moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And, uh, and that's what we have to do. I think probably more than ever before, we live in discouraging times, you know. And I say discouraging, I'm, I'm using that humanly speaking, because really as a child of God, hey, we have no reason to be discouraged, do we? I mean, we should be excited and knowing God's working everything out according to his plan and his timetable. But, but on the human side of that, I could say it's kind of discouraging times in the ministry. I don't know about here, but, you know, many men that I talked to back where I'm from, they, they mentioned that. But anyway, I look at Paul and I, I look at him as an example. And then number two, I, I was kind of thinking, what are some things that probably kept Paul going through the years? You know, because I think we all have to have something that keeps us going. And you say, well, we do. We got the Lord. Well, yes, truly we do. But I mean to break that down a little bit. And, uh, you know, one thing about Paul, and it's amazing when we think about, uh, about his ministry, how God used his hand to write much of the New Testament, for example, and all those things, but Paul was always kind of the outcast of the disciples, you know. Uh, I've, I've taught through many of the books of Paul, uh, well, uh, that Paul wrote, and uh, one thing you see over and over quite frequently, he was always the outcast, always had problems, someone was always giving him grief over something. But you know, one thing that I see in Paul's life that I think is so important is the first thing, he understood that God is sovereign and works all things out according to his will. You know, Paul knew about God's sovereignty. We can go back to the book of Romans for that and see that, and, and not just Romans, but in other places as well. You know, he, he knew that God had a plan for everything that was going on. Uh, makes me think of Nebuchadnezzar when he said, this is Daniel 4.34, uh, that says, And at the end of days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him that liveth forever 
whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from uh, generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Amen. You know, have you ever asked God, Lord, what are you doing? Now, Lord, why this? Lord, why has this come upon me? Well, we do ask that, don't we? The verse says, none can stay his hand, none can say to him. I think point being, yeah, we do say it sometimes, but the point is that there's no answer because God will do what he wants to do. He's sovereign, and he doesn't owe us an explanation. And, you know, I was thinking that's one thing I believe that kept, kept Paul. I mean, think about how much he suffered. He suffered a lot, you know. And, uh, and, and I was thinking this as well. You know, it's so easy to talk about God being a sovereign God and sing about it and... Amen about it and all that until things start going wrong in our own lives. Huh? And then that's when it's really put to the test. You know, we begin to think, well, I've always said God's sovereign. God knows what he's doing. God's working things out uh, for my good. But, you know, do we really believe that? And uh, it's a good question, isn't it? Do we really believe it? And as I said, it's easy to be happy and sing about it when we're happy and praise God for his sovereign plan. But sometimes when everything seems to be going wrong... Wow, that's when our faith is put to the test, you know, as the song says. And, uh, but, you know, focusing on that account of Nebuchadnezzar, you know, God was still as much God when Nebuchadnezzar was insane as when he was at himself, you know. And I've been telling, uh, preaching on this some at our church. You know, there, there was traditionally this idea, if something went wrong, well, the devil did it. You know, well, look what the devil's doing. Well, he might be doing it, but I'm just saying, if he is doing it, it's only because God permits him to do it, you know. And so we need to be careful we don't give the devil glory and honor and praise, you know, talking about those things. Um, but, but remember that, you know, God was still just as much God and Nebuchadnezzar was just as much in God's will when he was insane, crawling around eating grass like a beast. You know, God was still in control, and he was still within the plan of God because God was teaching him something. And so we need to remember that we do have a sovereign God. So everything that happens to us, uh, we can trust God and know that it's for, for his plan or by his plan. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know how often we try to put God's word through a filter and filter it through our own little pea brains, you know, and think, now if that makes sense, I'll accept it. But you know what? If it doesn't make sense, nah, I don't know about all that, you know. And, uh, you know, today I guess I'm probably, as they say, preaching to the choir, obviously. But, you know, that's kind of the human tendency, isn't it? If people can imagine things or filter it out and make sense out of it on their own level, then, oh, okay, yeah, I can, I can handle that. But, you know, if you can't make sense out of it, then the typical reaction is to reject it, you know. And, uh, but anyway, we, we have to be reminded of that. God's ways are not my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts, you know. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. The Bible says there, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And, you know, thinking about Paul, what... what what is one thing that would characterize his ministry? You know, I believe he was faithful. You know, and, and, but a word there that I see, usually I think about the word faithful there, but the word that I see that I want to point out is that word steward. You know what a steward is? Used to on the airlines, for you young babies that are here, used to be on the airlines, you had a steward or a stewardess, you know, and back in that day it was always a stewardess. You never saw a, a man stewardess, of course. Now you, whatever, we, we won't go there. They don't call them that anymore. They call them flight attendants, I guess. But you know, really that word stewards, an old-fashioned it just means someone that waits on someone else, you know. We go to a restaurant, we mention the waiter or the waitress. Well, what do they do? They wait on you, supposedly, you know. They, they get you what you want and uh, you, can I do anything for you? And, but anyway, what I'm likening that to is the word steward there in 1 Corinthians 4. And that's how God's word describes us. Hey, we're to be the stewards. 
And see, we get into trouble when we begin to think, no, I'm the Lord of the harvest. No, I, I'm in charge here. We're not in charge, you know. We're not the Lord of the harvest. We don't know what God's doing. We know what God wants us to do. And see, that's what we need to busy ourselves about, isn't it? Just make sure you're doing what God wants you to do because, hey, he, he's God. He's the Lord of the harvest. And don't forget, yeah, you are to be a faith, you are to be faithful. We are to be faithful. But we see there the word steward. We're supposed to be stewards. Steward, you know, that means we, we wait on God. And, and I don't mean that literally like, okay, God, come on. I mean to say we're, we're at God's pleasure. We serve God, right? We do what God wants us to do. And I think that's one thing Paul kept in mind. We know that we could go backwards to chapter 3 and chapter 1 about how some plant, some water, God gives the increase. And, you know, I think if there's anything that will encourage us along the way, if we just keep reminding ourselves, nope, the harvest is of God. You know, I need to make sure I'm faithful doing what I'm going to do. But, remember, hey, the harvest is of God. God will do as he pleases, you know, when he pleases to do that. And uh, Zechariah 4, 6, and I wrote my verse on paper. It says, not by might nor by power, but, my, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. You know, and many people can't accept the fact God's God and God's the one that will do according to his plan. So then they think, well, then I have to manufacture some kind of results. You know, I have to do this or I need to do that. And, but we need to go back to that truth, not by might nor by power, but, my, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Look at another passage there in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verses 15 through 18. Another thing I see about Paul that I believe helped him to stay in the ministry uh, is he didn't get involved in doubtful disputations. And I'm going to read that passage to you. But I'll say that again. He didn't get involved in doubtful disputations. Look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. It says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. For their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth of erred, saying the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. You know, I think what sticks out to me here, and I, I use different wording, but here in verse, uh, verse 16 it says, Shun profane and vain babblings. You know, again, at being many years in the ministry, not as many perhaps as some of you, but, but you know, through the years you see things. You know, and people begin to talk about this and talk about that. And, and what was the pastor down in Clarksville, Tennessee, Brother Ross or Brent? Do you remember that was a, he's with the Lord now? Uh, can't think of his name. No, the other one. Brother Garner Smith, yeah. You know, so I was at his church one time, and a few brethren came up, and they were asking me all these things, and, you know, these deep questions. I thought, hmm, never thought about that before, you know. And Brother, uh, Brother Smith came up. Yeah, I said, Brother, they're probably wanting to know how many angels you think can sit on the end of a pen. And he just laughed about it and walked off. You know, he had kind of an easy going way about him, but, I mean, they didn't think it was funny. They were, you know, they were all into these questions. But, you know, again, that's something I've seen through the years. People get all tied up. And think, well, how many angels can sit on the head of a pen? Now, you're probably sitting there thinking, I never heard of that one. Well, but you understand my point. People get off on things, get off on this and get off on that. And, and, uh, and, and, and as students of God's word, I think it's good to have an inquisitive mind. One of our members at Brentwoods, he always asks me this and that. And sometimes I have an answer and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I say, well, let's just wait and see. You'll have to ask the Lord one day. But it's good to have an inquisitive mind. But don't go to seed on it. You know, and I've known people that they'll get those questions in their head. And man, they begin to think about it, think about it. They just become consumed by it, you know. And every time they get up to preach, that's what they're preaching about. How many angels can sit on the head of this pen? Because I've been studying and I know at least, you know. And they go on and on and on. And they just go to seed on those things. And I kind of think that that's what Paul was giving us the warning about here. Shun profane and vain babblings. You know, vain babbling sometimes things that really don't have an answer. You know, it might be like a little riddle. You know, think about it. Well, yeah, kind of interesting to play around and think about that. But, hey, we'll just leave that to God and ask him about it one day. But, you know, Paul said shun those things. Shun the profane and vain babblings. Because it says they will increase unto more ungodliness. 
And I've seen that cycle. You know, people get all caught up in how many angels can sit on the pen. Next thing you know, they're off starting their own church to teach everybody how many angels can sit on that pen. You know, you got me. And, and off they go, you know, and they're no longer with us anymore. And so I think Paul, has an important point here is the warning he gave, shun profane and vain babblings because they just increase unto more ungodliness. And, you know, and having said that, I, certainly as God's people, we can separate, you know, say private convictions with, with, with doctrinal truths of God's word, you know. Uh, we talk about baptism. Hey, I, I think we're all in agreement on that, you know. We talk about the church and church truth. Well, I think we're all in agreement on that, hopefully. Or we talk about God's sovereignty and election and so on. I think we're in agreement on that. But, you know, there might be someone here that says, I don't have a TV in my home. Well, amen. Praise the Lord. Good for you, you know. And somebody else says, oh, I do. I got six of them. Well, okay. But you see, we don't go to seed on things like that. And I think that's the thing that Paul was warning when he said profane and ba- uh, shun profane and vain babblings because they all increase unto more ungodliness, you know. So, so we need to be careful of those things, don't we? Keep your eyes on the things that are important. You say, well, God's word's important. Well, absolutely. But Brother Brandon White last night, what a wonderful message on the gospel, you know. Remember, we need to be preaching the gospel, right? Remember, we need to be giving out the truth of God's word and, 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 and preaching God's word, you know. And I'm not up here to preach my little how many angels I think today is sitting on the end of a pen, you know. But many people go to seed on that. So, and Brandon, I can tell you later how many, brother, I think it is if you want me to. <laughs> He's he's back there with his fingers trying to count to see how many. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, just leave them on. We'll get to you a little bit later. Um, Go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Here we see some other great important, important things about Paul and his ministry passage you have read many a time I'm sure but if we go to Philippians chapter 3 and let's go on down there to uh, verse uh, well let's start in verse 1 finally my brethren rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous but for you it is safe beware of dogs beware of evil workers beware of the concision you know, again, that concision, that division, you know, beware of that. Stay, stay away from that. Paul says, we are of the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he have, hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, is touching the law of Pharisee, Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted for loss, uh, counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of God, uh, of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith. You know, taking some points from that, what do we see there about Paul that that kept him in the ministry? And as I go through these things, I say these are the same things that ought to keep us in the ministry. Now, if you're here and you're not a pastor, not necessarily called into the ministry per se, but you know what? You're, You're a Christian. You have a ministry, right? And as a child of God, make sure you're busy in your ministry, uh, witnessing to one another and proclaiming the, the good news of the gospel. But you know, one thing we see there about Paul uh, is that he had, he had no confidence in the flesh. And you say, well, I don't either. I don't have confidence in the flesh. Well, sometimes we do, you know. Especially, I think, newer Christians, we got that mindset that, well, I need to do the very best. Yeah, I got to pray and I do this and that and... And don't get me wrong, we need to do our best, you know. I'm not saying don't, but I'm saying we kind of got that mindset, thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. Now I'm going to do my best to be what you want me to be. And yeah, humanly, that sounds good. And and actually, it's right. We need to do our best. But what I'm saying, but don't trust in your flesh. 
You see what I'm saying? It's, it's God in you, you know. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. So anything that you're able to do for the Lord, you know what? It's not because oh, I'm trying, I'm doing my best. And you better need to trust in the Lord, right? Because you know what? Our flesh is weak. And I know Paul here, he was comparing his, you know, if you're thinking of salvation, he said, you know what, if you're, if you're thinking about that, you're thinking about a righteous person, man, who but me, you know. And he mentions he was circumcised, and he gives us credentials there in verse 5, the tribe of, ben, of Benjamin, the Hebrews of the Hebrews, and touching the law and blameless and stuff. But he shows us, but you know what, salvation's in Christ, right? And I tell you that salvation is in Christ, but you know what else is? Victorious living is in Christ, you know. And something else, our faithfulness, you know, that faith that, that we have. And we know the Lord gave us that faith. Um, it's interesting in verse 9 how that's, how that's worded. It says, the faith of Christ Jesus. Notice that in verse 9. Be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ Jesus. It's interesting. You know where we get our faith? The Lord gives it to us, right? Ephesians 2, 8, 9, remember that passage, you know, our faith is given to us even by the Lord. So even that faith, we have, hey, that comes from Christ. See, so I can't trust in my flesh. I got to keep my eyes on the Lord. Paul did not trust to his flesh. Uh, let's read a little bit more there from Philippians 3 and verse 10. Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto, unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended. Verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, if we, if we looked at Paul's life and dissected it, let's say it that way, if we looked at those details, you know, one thing that I see about Paul, number one, he had a purpose, didn't he? His purpose was to know God. And that purpose of knowing God, that was far greater than being in shackles in a prison, you know. Or that purpose to know God was far greater than being beaten, you know, with a, with a whip. I mean, his, pur I, his purpose, I want to know God. And it wasn't just something he said on Sunday morning for an hour. I mean, he was just possessed with that, I want to know God, you know, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. So, you know, he had a purpose. You know, do we have a purpose? You know, we, and sometimes lightheartedly or flippantly we say, well, yeah, sure, I, I want to live for God and I want to do what, well, amen, you know, but, you know, is it deeper than that? Do we really have that purpose that keeps us going even when things are tough? You know, even when we're suffering, do we still have that purpose? And I believe Paul had that purpose to glorify God. Whether soever, therefore, you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So that was his purpose. He had a purpose. He didn't rely on his flesh. And something else I see there, he forgot about those things which were past. And I saw that down in that verse... Uh, um, verse 13, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Now, if we look back in Philippians chapter 1, he was kind of remembering about the past. He is remembering the benefits or the blessings of ministry. And he's talking about that like, wow, thank God, you know, you're, you're my joy in the Lord. And he talked about that. So, you know, here, it, uh, sometimes people say, is it wrong to look back? Is it bad to look back to the past? Well, Depends on what you're looking at there. If you're looking back at God's blessings, think, wow, God was so good to me, and how God sustains us all, God is so good, well, amen. But you know what? If you're looking back to those rough times, if you're looking back to those hard times, you know what? You need to just forget those and leave them where they are in the past. And I think that every one of us here, we've been around the block a few times, you know enough to know that we go through life, and, and sometimes those things that things happen, and you think, now, Lord, why did this happen? Now, Lord, I'm trying to serve you, and Lord, I'm trying to put you first in my life, and Lord, with everything within me, Lord, I, I want to please you, and I want to serve you, so Lord, why did this happen, you know? You might say, what's the this? Well, we all might have her this, whatever it might have been, you know? Things that you pray and pray and pray about it, and you just feel like, yep, God's going to give the victory on that, and then, but it doesn't turn out that way, does it? And if you're not careful, you know what? You can get down about it. 
Because again, you start looking to yourself and you think, but wait, I've been praying. Well, wait, I've been living for God. Wait, I, I've been putting God first. Well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm serving the Lord. I'm, I'm Lord with all my might, I'm trying to serve. And then it just seems like the ceiling caves in. And you know, if you're not careful, those things will, they'll destroy you. You know, they'll, they'll mess you up. Unless, and we know God will step in and, and lift us up. We know that. But I'm just saying, if we look at those kinds of things, you know what, we're, huh, we're on slippery ground, aren't we? Paul said, forgetting those things which are past. And, you know, I'm sure that every one of us could say, yep, I remember this or I remember that, but, yep, I'm going to go back. There. I'm going to keep my eyes on the Lord. And Paul kept his eyes on the Lord. And uh, so he forgot about the past. He kept his eyes on the things of the Lord. And so we see his confidence was in the Lord, you know. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And you know what? That power of the resurrection, that's more than just salvation, Thank God it is salvation. Thank God we're saved by it. But you know, the power of the resurrection, it, it helps us to be victorious. It makes us victorious over sin. So when we're struggling and we're, we're going through that hard time, again, the power of the resurrection in us, you know, Christ in me, uh, the whole hope of glory. So Paul kept his eyes on the Lord. Uh, my brother Brent and I grew up on a farm in Claremont County up in Buckeye Land, Brother Sean, up in Buckeye Land. Uh, we grew up on a farm up there, and, and my dad used to have this cedar. He had set the hay fields with this cedar, and, uh, and he had put us kids out at one end of the field, and he had walking on seed along, and he'd just keep his eyes on the cedar. And, and, after, and by cedar, some of you might not even know what I'm talking about. You crank it, and seed comes out, right? And he'd walk along the field. Then he'd move us up 20 feet and do that. And, and, uh, but he'd always keep his eye on the mark because he'd say, if I don't keep my eye on it, then I'll get messed up. He'd say, don't go over there and move. And he wasn't very nice the way he'd say it, by the way. Don't move. Stay right where I tell you to stay. And, you stay, you know, and he'd keep his eyes right on you and, and walk. Well, why was that? To go on a straight line. I had an aunt, Brother Ross. Man, she was, a, she was the prince of, princess of gardening. I mean, her gardens were just beautiful. And, and I was, how do you get your rose so straight? And she'd just take an old push plow and, you know, lay off her rose. Said, how do you keep your rose straight? Well, go, you got to pick out something at the other end. And when you pick out something at the other end, don't veer off. Just go straight toward it. Don't move to the right or the left. Just keep going straight. And when you get down there, your rose will be all nice and straight. You say, what's that got to do with anything? That's, you know, keeping your eyes on the Lord. Amen. You know, if we get our eyes off the Lord and start thinking about all the vain babbling... Or we start thinking about brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so or what happened last week. Or, you know, we get our eyes off the Lord. Next thing you know, we're all messed up. Yeah. So the idea there is keep your eyes on the Lord. So Paul forgot about the things that were past and, and kept his eyes on those things which were before. And uh, another thing about Paul, I think he understood and he well knew he wasn't home yet. <clears throat> I say that a lot about Brentwood. You know what? Just hang in there. You're not home yet. What am I talking about? Remember Paul when he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain? Huh? Paul knew that no matter what happens to me, you know, my final, my final step is to step into home. So since my final step, I know I'm going to go home, well then it's okay if this happens or that happens because, hey, I'm on my way home and God's going to take care of it. And Paul understood that he wasn't home yet. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is a battle we'll have until the Lord does call us home. 1 Corinthians 9. Verse 25. 1 Corinthians 9, 25. It says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. See, there again, Paul knew his purpose. Paul knew why he was doing what he was doing. And Paul knew that even if he suffered, even if he was in jail and going hungry or being beaten, or he knew whatever was going on, he knew why he was doing it. He had a purpose. So he said there, uh, so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. In verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. You know, Paul was all about keeping his body under subjection. 
You know, it, many times we go through this temptation. Should I do this or should I do that? Well, keep your body under subjection. Keep your body uh, where God wants you to be. Keep doing what God wants you to do. And, uh, and that's what we need to see there, doing what God wants us to do. And keep your body under subjection, the Bible says. So, you know, and again, how many times, you know, our, our minds and by the body, guess what controls your body? You say, well, the Lord does. Well, humanly, what controls your, our body? Our mind does. So, you know, there again, be careful what you put in your mind. And Paul told us what kinds of things we ought to think about, you know. So, you know, when, whenever I face a temptation and that temptation comes my way, in my mind I consider it, and in my mind I either say, nope, you know, cut it off and that's it, or I, I just, yeah, okay, yeah, I think we'll go there for a little while, you know. So it happens in your mind, the battle for your mind. So to keep your body under subjection, you know what you need to do? Keep your mind where it needs to be. Keep your mind right. When you're thinking about those depressive thoughts or those disappointments or what, well, just cut them off. Why, why even think about it, you know? And uh, so Paul said, keep your body, and he did keep his body. So we need to keep our bodies under subjection. But, you know, I think the key to that is our mind. What do we think about? What kind of things do we play out in our heads? You know, it's amazing how much your minds can, woo, and go off the deep end, you know, vain imaginations, you know. And uh, look at Philippians 4.13. Uh, 4, 6, and 7, I'm sorry, Philippians 4. In verse 8, Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You know, and, and that's kind of like a little list there, talking about a filter. We was talking earlier about how human beings, we kind of tend to have a filter. And if we like something, we receive, we don't. And, you know, and, and, you know we, fil- we should filter things through the Word of God. The Bible says, whatsoever things are, are true. You know, how many times we get things in our head. You know what, I think so-and-so's mad at me. Or, you know what, I think that... I think so-and-so's talking about me. Or you know what? And you know how we human beings are. Was it true? That's not true. Cut it out. You know, don't even think about that. Whatsoever things are true and, and honest and just. You know, the devil will feed you a lie, won't he? Anything the devil comes along and offers to you, you know, it, it's probably a lie. And it is a lie. Look how he tempted the Lord Jesus. Really, one lie right after another. You know, and you got to be on your toes because somebody might say, well, even use Scripture, you know, in tempting the Lord. But you see, that's why we study God's Word. But whatsoever things are honest and just and, and pure, and, you know, and keep your mind. Proverbs 4 tells us, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And, you know, it's not just talking about that organ beating away. It, it's your thought life, your mind. So protect that, uh, the gate of your mind. So, you know, as we look at Paul, I, uh, through the years I've seen many people that I look at and I think, man, they've been faithful. How, you know, what a, what a blessing, you know. I think of uh, missionary Paul Mulling, went to Peru when he was just a young man, had his two little kids. And uh, he, I can probably say this now because they're all with the Lord, but when he first went to Peru in the 60s, uh, grandma and grandpa had a fit. They said, how could you take those kids to the jungle? They even went to children's services and did their best to get their kids taken away from them. Can you believe that? Brother Paul just kept right at it. Nothing moved him. And uh, just all the hardships they had, nothing moved them. I mean, he was there to serve God, you know. And many people we could think of like that, people that have been faithful through the years. You know, there's something to be said about being a faithful servant. And I think us here today, that's our hearts cry to God, Lord, help me to be faithful. No matter if I suffer, and Paul understood that, talked about knowing Jesus and his suffering and so on. Paul understood even if I follow the Lord, it may involve some suffering. (coughs) Excuse me. But you know what? He kept his eyes on the Lord. That's what we need to do. You know, you're going to go through discouragements. Yep, I'll be discouraged if you play on it. You know, pan it out in your head. You'll go through that. But you know what? Keep your eyes on the Lord. You might go through suffering. might go through a disease. Who knows? You might go through hardships. But you know what? Keep your eyes on the Lord. Paul said that I may know him. And, and, and that's what we must do. So, you know, we look at Paul and we see these wonderful things there. The secret of his success. 
And I use that word secret, but really it's no secret. It's right there in the Word of God, isn't it? It's probably not a good word to use for it, but the, 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 solu- the way of Paul's success, and God help us to be successful. You know, God help us not to fall away. God help us not to get all caught up on how many angels can sit on the head of a pen. And, and you know, I, I know that's silly, and I'm not trying to bring up things on purpose. But, I mean, help us, Lord, help us to keep our eyes on you, not get waylaid, not get sidetracked. 